everyone. I'm Debbie Epstein Henry. I'm vice president of the forum, and it is my distinct honor today to interview my dear friend Nicole Perkins. How are you, Nicole? I'm great. I'm so excited to be having this conversation with you. It's uh, it's it's one that we've had on a number of occasions, and it's uh, it's really exciting to bring it to the forum. Absolutely. And I want to welcome our forum members and guests. And I want to encourage everyone to look up Nicole on LinkedIn or otherwise. She's had an illustrious career uh, as both an attorney and a financial services executive. But today we're really getting personal with Nicole. And I actually met Nicole over 20 years ago. We were law firm associates together and we've been among each other's closest friends ever since. And so we've had a lot of these conversations over the years in person and, and more recently, of course, by video and, and phone. And so it really is something special that we can share this with all of you. So, um, so anyway, um, I wanna encourage people to write questions in the chat. I'm going to give some sort of opening questions to Nicole and then we'll open it up I have a feeling that there's gonna be a lot to say. And um, so forgive me in advance if I can't leave everybody in, um, but I will do my very best. So with that, Nicole, we both love to story tell. So I wanna start with you telling a story that you wanna share about your life. And that is an example of one of the many times you faced racism. Absolutely. So I thought about this and I decided that uh, I'm gonna tell a story that I've told before that it just seems to resonate with a lot of people, but particularly women. Um, so one morning years ago on my way to work, and at the time I was practicing law at, actually at one of the largest law firms in the country. And I stopped at my neighborhood coffee shop in Society Hill, Philadelphia. And in the coffee shop, uh, I saw a friend that I hadn't seen in a while and she was with her brand new baby girl. And we did some quick catching up and I asked her how everything was going because I remembered how hard those first few weeks are with a newborn. And she told me that she was indeed struggling. So we started chatting and as I was giving her my thoughts and my advice on you know, what she should be doing with the baby or what I had been doing with my children, I noticed that there was a woman standing next to me waiting for her coffee uh, and she was listening to our conversation. She was sort of nodding and smiling at what I was saying. And then when my coffee arrived, I said goodbye to my friend and I headed out. And the woman was leaving at the same time. And so we were headed in the same direction and we sort of ended up walking step and step together to the end of the block uh, to wait for the light. So now to understand what happened next, it's important to know how I was feeling at that moment because I know I didn't understand it at the time and it was only after kind of thinking about this a number of times that I realized that I was coming out of that coffee shop that morning feeling really powerful. And that's because, uh, you know, obviously I'd helped my friend, which always feels good, but what it did was it validated my parenting skills, which often felt at odds at that time. I was a um, part-time working mom. And in addition to just kind of you know, the craziness of the morning and getting things together, there's this really deep emotional level of leaving your kids behind to go to work. And you kind of feel split. But on that morning, I had put on my black suit, I held it together. And I had this sort of trifecta experience of you know, I had my emotional act together and intact. I felt good and I felt like a good mom and I felt like a successful professional. So as we stood waiting for the light, this woman and I, <clears throat> she said something to me to acknowledge that she had indeed been listening to our conversation with my friend. And she said that she thought I had given my friend some really good parenting advice. And she seemed really genuine and very nice. So I smiled and I thanked her and then it happened. She turned to me and with a really pleasant but somewhat quizzical look on her face, she said, are you a nanny? Ugh, it was like a sucker punch <laughs> to the gut. I mean, just four little words. They don't seem like that big a deal, but it totally cut me at my, nails, at my knees. And uh, I was almost speechless, but I kind of mustered up the smallest bit of power that she hadn't gutted. And I just turned to her and I just said, no, I'm not. And 
as I was saying it, I could see that something registered on her face, her own understanding that humiliation she just made a really offensive mistake. Yeah. Um, and when I got to work, you know, I was still shocked and hurt and kind of, you know, musing over what had just happened, but I didn't say anything to anyone at all because I thought, you know, what could I say? Oh my gosh, can you believe this woman just called me a nanny? I mean, it, it's not like she, you know, called me a racial slur. She didn't assault me. She wasn't yelling at me. She was in fact very nice. Um, so I didn't know what to say. And even if I did, I think I knew in the back of my mind that they wouldn't really understand how offensive it was. And worse, they probably would have assumed that it wasn't racist and that, oh, it was just some kind of misunderstanding. So I just ended up carrying that hurt and that shock and uh, never said anything to anyone about it. But it's a story that you know I've carried over the years. And particularly whenever I was with my children or with my friend's children, I was always very anxious about Am I going to be asked if I'm a nanny? So that's that's just you know one story that I can think of that again really seems to resonate with women when I tell it. And I think, and you and I of course have talked about this story. And I think what's interesting is among all the stories that you could have shared and the different types of racism you faced, I think it's really interesting why you chose this one. And I think it it would be valuable to share not only why you chose it, but had it happened today, how would you react, react differently and why? Yeah, I was concerned about telling what seems to be such a almost fluffy uh, story because of- Particularly in this backdrop In right this now. backdrop, exactly. You know, right now, there frankly are just such horrible examples of, of deadly racism. Uh, and, and that has given rise to conversation about race, which is you know, obviously a very good thing. But my fear is that people tend to look at these acts of violent racism, particularly you know, by a certain group of people like the police, and can tend to make a really comfortable assumption that racism is something very obvious, uh, that racism is something that is angry or violent, if not in action, in words. And when we do that, I think, there's also that tendency to make the assumption that racism is carried out by those other racist actors and not the person making those assumptions. When in fact, you know, most racism looks just like the story I told. Uh, you know, that story happened about 20 years ago, but a version of that happens to me all the time. <laughs> I have tons of stories about that. Uh, so if that happened today, because like, my kids are not little anymore, but uh, I probably would have reacted the same way directly with that woman. I probably would have just said no, because in the moment, it's really hard to kind of figure out what's the best way to proceed. But what I think I would have done differently is that I wouldn't have been silent about it with my colleagues when I got to work. And that's because I've matured over the years and uh, it's important for me to tell my story. But I think that the environment now actually is a place where it's conducive to tell those stories. And it's important for people to hear, yes, the really horrific, deadly stories of racism, but also that there are these little nicks and cuts that happen every day. I wanna come back to this whole notion of the ability to have those conversations, because I agree the entree is there now more than ever, but there are still, as we've talked about, a lot of stumbling blocks that are impeding those conversations. So I wanna come back to that, but I wanna stick with this story a little more first, because it educates us, I think, in so many ways, in addition to the ways you've already expressed. One is you've said to me over the years, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, that privilege is the luxury of not thinking before you speak. And I wanna say that again, because I think it's really powerful. Privilege is the luxury of not thinking before you speak. Yeah. Tell us what you mean by that and how we can change that tendency of people with privilege. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's one aspect of privilege, right? But um, what I mean by that is, you know, when I think back about why would such a simple question, are you the nanny, um, have such a long lasting impact on me and probably not so much on the woman who said it. 
And I think it's because that question symbolizes really deep rooted assumptions that this woman and, and a lot of people jump to when they see someone like me in a moment that doesn't quite add up for whatever reason. Um, and in that moment, I think, you know, for that woman, it was that a black woman with good parenting skills uh, or a well-dressed black woman in an affluent neighborhood must be a nanny and not simply a good mother, a businesswoman, uh, a neighbor, and particularly a black woman whose opinion is being sought by a white woman must be about parenting, must be a nanny and not simply that woman's friend who has some good advice that she's seeking. So having that curiosity about what's going on here, to me, you know, I think she knew that it didn't make sense. That's why she was asking the question, right? You know, what, what, what's going on here? I'm trying to figure this out. And that's a luxury to have that curiosity and to ask a question that can have such a long reaching impact um, and not even be aware of what consequences and impact that would have. It's just the, the privilege, the luxury of getting your answers, getting what you want immediately without regard for what that impact may be for the other person. Um, the funny thing is, you know, look, I don't think this woman was a bad person. And although the question was racist, I don't think she was a racist. <laughs> I think she simply had that privilege and wanted to find out what was interesting and curious in her immediate setting. So I think, you know, your articulation of that is so spot on. And I think we all are thinking about the mistakes we've made. I know I have made mistakes that I feel terrible about. And one of my favorite diversity experts is Renee Myers and her second book is titled, What If I Say the Wrong Thing? So we all are gonna make mistakes and that's not at all legitimizing them, but it is a reality. And so the question is, what do we do when we make those mistakes? What should this woman have done after she asked you this question? She knew, as you described, right, yeah. from looking at her face, the humiliation of what an idiot she is for making those assumptions and then articulating, seizing on that curiosity, as you described. So that's the question. What should she have done? And if she had done something that you're suggesting that may be different, would you still be thinking about it 20 plus years later? It's a great question and you're right. I mean, mistakes happen and I think that there is, um, you know, I'm not sure there's anything that she could have done after asking the question. You know, perhaps if she, you know, said, oh my gosh, that was a really stupid racist question. You know, I'm sorry. Obviously that would have, you know, made it a little less hurtful. Um, but I don't really think that once something is said, uh, there's a lot of opportunity to, to make it right in the moment because the damage is already done. And, and frankly, recognition of the mistake and an apology tends to make the actor feel better, but not necessarily the injured person. But I think it would have been great, and maybe she did this, because again, there was something about her that I felt that she just, you know, she stumbled, right? Um, and if she went home and talked to her circle of people about that exchange and explored what happened and what it meant, that would be great. It would be great if, you know, when she then heard a different assumption made about a Black person in her walk of life, uh, you know, that she could make that connection and begin to explore where else such assumptions play out in her life and in other people's lives. Uh, so. I'm not sure, look, we're all going to make mistakes. I've made mistakes. Uh, you know, there's sometimes it's just, it's going to happen. But I think rather than trying to make yourself feel better in the moment, take from that, take it to your, your circle of trusted folks and really start to examine it and, and understand what happened, even if you're not sure, uh, because maybe she didn't understand precisely what was wrong with the question, but she 
you know, she clearly knew something was going on. And to go home and say, you know, I saw this woman and explain the, the interaction and, and say what happened. And then maybe that would spark a conversation for more understanding of how that's really hurtful. I mean, it, you know, it really, again, I didn't lose my life. It wasn't an act of violence. I have, you know, a very successful career. I was on my way to work as an attorney, but it definitely took something from me uh, that day, as well as, you know, years later. And I think part of it is a feeling of belonging. You know, you described, and when you originally told me the story, of all words that you described that moment, feeling was power. Yes. And you did feel, you know, and, you, and the way you described it to me and, and here today was the, the, the last shred of power that you had when, you know, was to say, no, I'm not that nanny. But to be able to take that from somebody, you know, that that's a yes. piece here um, of belonging that, is, is lost. And I, I want to use that and, and sort of turn back to the reference you made earlier that had this happened today, you would have responded differently in terms of coming to your community of colleagues. And I think there's a lot of discussion right now about the importance of having honest and uncomfortable conversations. And that's something this DE&I committee that's hosting today's discussion, which I'm really grateful for, um, has, has hosted a topic, a program precisely on that topic, Kelly Hodge and others um, were instrumental to that. But that presumes that there's actually enough trust to even start those conversations or to take the risks that are involved to broach these conversations and really delve deep. So two questions along those lines, and I'll just throw one at you to start. How do we build the trust in our communities and on our workplaces to be able to have those uncomfortable conversations because we really, that's the starting place that you said, you know, you didn't feel comfortable with at the time at your workplace. Mm -hmm. How do we change those communities so that you would today be comfortable to have that conversation? It's so important. And the, the key word that you spoke was trust. Uh, trust is so important in these conversations. So it's, it's no surprise that sometimes people with good intentions come to the table to have these conversations, but without a basis of trust, they can often go awry, you know, and really people get hurt and offended and, or equally uh, problematic are stifled, right? Because they're afraid of right. saying the wrong thing. Chilling the conversation. Chilling the conversation. So, uh, you know, I, it really has to start on both sides. You know, Black people have to be able to share these stories so that white people can understand the everyday experiences. And white people have to be able to listen and hear them without assumption, without judgment. And this is, I think, the really hard part, and it, it's probably most important. I think when white people come to the table to listen and hear, they have to be okay with recognizing themselves in some of those experiences and recognizing the, their own assumptions that they too make. And then I think if we can do that, you start to build some trust, right? Um, and the sharing of these experiences can't be about disbelief or sugarcoating or explaining away you know, well, that wasn't racist or, you know, oh, don't worry about that. Or that's one bad actor. That's another thing that I've always had. Well, don't worry about her. Right. She's it's just not a bad actor, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, th th there has to be that on one side, but on the other side, on the, you know, the, the Black folks who are sharing these experiences, it also can't be about shaming and blaming. Um, it really has to be about coming to a common understanding and the acceptance that there is this widespread existence of these experiences. That's the basis for the foundation. And then I think as you continue to build that trust and as people have that common acceptance and understanding that this is a reality, racism in America 
in all forms and shapes really does exist on a very pervasive level. Um, that's when I think you can really start to dig in and have, frankly, the kind of conversations that you and I have right. all the time. I mean, when we first <laughs> became friends, uh, you know, we were talking about babies, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, you know, and being lawyers. Um, and it wasn't until um, many years later, uh, including, I'm going to beat you to the punch, including this morning when we were talking about black hair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so at that moment, and we, we do need to share with the audience, and I'm glad you brought it up because I, this was like a moment where I was like, I've truly arrived as a white woman. My dear friend, Nicole, is now conferring and consulting with me. I mean, I've been witness to the conversation, but I've never been invited in. I was like, who cares if I screw up today's interview? I've arrived on hair, at least. You're in the club now. <laughs> I know I'm still a bystander, but I'm really a, a, a very eager one. And oh, there's, there's, there's so much more you're going to learn about black hair. Uh, <laughs> We're going to do a separate program on that. Okay, that's sorry. Right, to that's right. <laughs> well, I want to actually, I want to pick up on the conversation piece because we, we were talking about in the larger context of, you know, colleagues and, and having a workplace and have that sort of trust and build that. But what I do think is interesting is even when you have close relationships like ours, Trust is still hard. And I remember after George Floyd's murder, when I reached out to you for the first time and sent you a text as we normally, you know, correspond. And then I didn't get my immediate response from you. And I was like, oh my God, I, that was terrible of me to send a text that was wrong. That was not the right, you know, medium. And, you know, and, and I was toiling about it. And, you know, it, so the point is that it's always, it's always there that you want to be working on it. You want to be sensitive. You want to be attentive and you're going to mess up. I mean, even, you know, and, and, and of course in our situation, you told me later, no, I was just so overwhelmed. Like, of course my text was like long down on your list as, as it should be at that point. So I think that's another piece here. And I want to ask you about that because when I interviewed bias expert, Dolly Chug, she talked about in our act interactions with people that we need to both show the light and the heat in our interactions to really make change and to be effective communicators. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about that with us, about the light and the heat and how, if you agree, both need to be in the mix. Yeah, it, it's, it's so important. And like I said before about building the trust, it, it's, it has to start with the light. You know, I don't care what the topic is. If you're coming at a relationship all with heat and, you know, you've got to listen to only heat and, you know, there's never going to be any lightness in this, that, that's a hard relationship and trust to build. Um, so it starts with the light, the sharing and the listening. But then as that trust and connection is built, then yeah, I think there does need to be, be a degree of heat that comes to it. Um, with you and I in that circumstance, you know, the heat probably was the form of silence, frankly. So, you know, he doesn't have to mean, you know, a blowtorch. It can also just mean, you know what? I can't deal with this and your question right now. Um, I need to, I don't even know what I need right now, but I can't, I can't respond to you. And I'm sure that felt as close to friends as we are as a shutdown. Um, but that was what, you know, I needed in that moment during that, that time of the uh, George Floyd murder. Um, you know, another incident of racism that I experienced uh, was when I was pregnant and I had fainted on uh, South Street, busy street in Philadelphia. And I had my uh, two young children with me. I was pregnant with my third. And I, I had kept consciousness, so I was aware, but I was, you know, down on the ground and I was clearly in distress with my two kids. And yet no one offered me any help at all. Literally walked by me. It was the middle of the day, sunny day, work day. Stepped um, over you, as you told me. St st yeah. Literally stepped over me, exactly. And, you know, and I had kind of pushed my kids back up against the, uh, the building and, you know, got my cell phone out and managed to call my husband who uh, came to pick me up. And when I told 
another one of my dear, dear closest friends uh, who happens to be white about it. Uh, and that I had concluded after some time that it had to be because I was black, that there, you know, there was this assumption that I was, I guess, homeless or on drugs or something uh, because I knew that if that was a white woman with two adorable little kids pregnant who had slumped down onto the street, that people would not be walking over her. I just knew it. Um, so my friend, she was horrified by the incident. Absolutely. But she also said something that, you know, to the, to the extent that, well, oh, I, I, I doubt it was because of race. I, I, I have no idea what happened. That was so horrible. And we moved on. Um, and I remember her saying on. that. You did we not did not move on. on. Well, yeah, we moved on from that point. Um, right. And I didn't really address it. I did not bring the heat in that moment. I just let it go. But recently she came to me after kind of everything that's been happening with race. Uh, and she pointed out that she raised that story again. So she, obviously something about what was taking place currently in the conversations about race had her go back to that moment in time. And she expressed her remorse for not willing to feel the heat in that moment, you know? And I think for her, it was easy, at the time, it was easier for her to not see that her neighborhood or her neighbors could be racist actors. And frankly, probably a lot easier to not see that she too might have been someone who stepped over a black woman laying on the sidewalk. She wouldn't have stepped over me, Nicole, of course not. But she might have stepped over a black woman who looked like me with two children um, on, on the sidewalk. So I think, uh, you know, I'm so grateful that she came back with that because then Absolutely. we had a really good conversation about it. But I think that's those moments that black people and really anyone involved in the conversation has to take the moment to say, you know what, I know we're having a good conversation. I know we've built the trust. We are in sync here on this, but something in this conversation needs addressing needs that heat to make sure that we don't both walk away from this conversation with either hurt feelings, feeling dismissed, or feeling like you're not someone I'm gonna be able to continue the conversations with. Thankfully, this was a, again, a really, really dear friend of mine. So of course we continued a very good relationship since, but had that been a work colleague or somebody else, you know, that really has that chilling effect and it just shuts down the conversation. So we have to have the bravery and the risk of bringing the heat to those conversations if we really want to make uh, inroads with those people that we're talking with. And I think risk is a big piece here. It's, mm -hmm. it's really putting yourself out yeah. there. There's been some really great comments in the chat um, around making yourself vulnerable. And that is what's part of this too. And I think if we're not willing to do that, then we're not going to be able to advance those relationships. And I think part of the strain right now, too, is that there's, it almost feels forced, like a lot of people want to be having these conversations because race is at such a heightened mm -hmm. level of attention. But a lot of these conversations originate from trust and real relationships with us. You, you indicated, you know, we met as lawyers with as, as young moms with kids comparable ages. You want to be able to relate and connect on issues outside of race so that the foundation of the relationship is strong there regardless. Right. But I, I, I want to talk more about this because I want to ask about how white women can do better to support women of color and also ask relatedly, is there a give and take that's needed between women of color, women of color and white women to really make that support happen? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think women in general have the capability and the capacity to bring so much compassion and trust to a situation. And it's really only when the defenses are there that we miss that opportunity. You know, it's hard. I, I think you have to meet people where they are. So, you know, not everyone 
at this moment is going to be able to go as far as someone else in a conversation about race or to be able to hear and absorb some of the things about race uh, until some time has passed and some work at it has passed. But I do think that there are some particularly, you know, in, in this forum, the forum of executive women, you know, these are, we were, we're all uh, mostly, you know, working women in corporate settings. Um, there's some low hanging fruit that I think is, uh, you know, good to think about. Uh, I think that there's a missed opportunity when white women in the corporate setting use their platform to advance women's issues without understanding and speaking to and including the very specific issues of black women in those uh, platforms. Because look, as a corporate executive working on issues of diversity, uh, you know, meeting with senior leaders and trying to uh, work at the, the problem of the lack of uh, diversity of people for people of color, I saw firsthand how the increased representation and opportunity for white women has frankly become the stand-in for those companies of achieving diversity. So if the numbers are up for white women in terms of representation, in terms of promotion, in terms of compensation, um, it's, and this is not everywhere, um, but there is a tendency to say, let's check the box, we've achieved diversity, when in reality, it's not diversity for all. And in fact, the gap gets wider, particularly as there's this notion uh, for white men or corporations in general, that they've, we've been making such inroads on diversity. That's on the corporate level. Um, on the personal level, you know, look, I think when you have skin in the game, you invest and then you protect what you've invested in much deeper ways than when you don't. So, you know, I know a lot of truly good and deeply concerned white women who want to make a difference regarding race. But I also see that a lot of those same women have no diversity in their personal lives, their friends, their family, their neighborhood, their children's school, their children's friends, the venues that they frequent, you know, all of the, the books that they read, there really is no diversity in their personal lives. And, you know, I think that the level of diversity in your personal life is directly connected to the priority of diversity in your heart. My favorite philosopher, I don't know if you know this um, quote is Montaigne and the quote is every movement reveals us. And I think about that in everything and your comment right now about people's personal lives, that those are choices that we're making every day. And they're and, hard. I'm not yeah. saying it's easy, you know, right. it, it, it's hard, but I'm particularly speaking to those women who I know want to figure this out. Right. and want to solve this issue. Right. I, I, um, I was referencing Brene Myers before and I told you this, you, you made fun of me, but she, she has so many good recommendations. And one is just like, you know, just check your own, how you gravitate to things. Like you're getting on an Amtrak train and yeah. you, it's crowded. So you have to sit with somebody and you're white. Why are you sitting with a white person? So now like, and I told you this, Nicole, like every time I'm on an Amtrak <laughs> I'm like seeking out diverse people to sit with next to, it. and and Nicole's like, "Don't be a stalker, Debbie." Like, you gotta, gotta. But I said to Debbie, meanwhile, I'm the black person who's like, "Oh my God, why is she sitting next to me?" <laughs> but I think I think the idea is it comes to which a whole another discussion, which I, I unfortunately don't know if we're going to have time for, but really about you know s structural changes, which I think is so much around the answers here is put rules on yourself of what you're going to do. Like after you've asked one woman who wasn't pregnant, you know, <laughs> when she's due, 
like the rule for myself after I made that mistake is like, I don't care if the woman's getting wheeled into the delivery room. I'm just, I'd rather her think I'm rude on that front. And like, I'll never ask that question again, unless the baby is in hand. Um, I want to open it up to questions and see if we can get, uh, get I, there, again, great comments in the chat, but not specific questions per se. And if anybody wants to jump in, just turn on your mic and just really briefly put out that question. I want to invite that. I've got plenty more to ask, but um, there's such a dynamic discussion. I just want to invite that. So I'm just going to pause for a sec. God, I know so many of you. I could start calling you, but I'm not going to, I'm going to hold myself back. But please, if you want to, feel free to <laughs> send me a note if you want to ask a question and just turn on your mic. Um, you know, yes, Deb, it's ahead. interesting, and, and uh, stop me when we get a question, because I definitely want to um, address that. But, you know, your point about, uh, you know, don't ever ask a woman if she's pregnant. Um, it's really, it's really, it's funny, but it's a very good analogy, because I think, look, there are times where I make those same faux pas with, with race. Um, you and I were talking the other day, I was in Whole Foods, and, uh, and let me flip it for a minute. Often, 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 I am approached and asked, you know, excuse me, can you help me with something? Do you have this here? Assuming that I work there, right? You know, I don't work at the supermarket. I don't work wherever. But I was at Whole Foods the other day, and I don't know if any of you have been shopping recently, but, you know, with the pandemic, the rise in uh, professional shoppers you know, is, is, it has really risen. And so there was this young black guy who was there and, you know, he had on his rubber gloves and he had the bags with the, uh, you know, the, the order on it. And he was systematically going and getting stuff. And I went up to him and I asked him, you know, where's the goat cheese? <laughs> and it, he looked at me and it was hysterical because his response was perfect. He just went, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And then, I, of course, I immediately realized what I had done. And, you know, I said, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And he's like, yeah, no worries. Um, so I think we also have to kind of get over ourselves a little bit. You know, this is a really serious topic and an incredibly difficult construct to break. Uh, but there's also just human error. And sometimes things just happen and you have to move on. Um, and it's just like, you know, I too have asked a woman if she's pregnant, you know, and my rule now is never, never, never ask anyone if they are pregnant ever. Um, and, you know, the rule is, you know, don't you know, ask people if they, you know, if they work there, find out, see if there's a name tag, see what's going on. But, you know, I just think it's interesting that it happens to a lot of us. Right. But I, I do want to come back to the point you made around the luxury of privilege. And so one, one solution here is the rule you or I imposed on ourselves around pregnant women. Same with, and I learned this again from Verne about, you know, the disproportionate number of people of color who are asked about directions and presumed or assumed to be store employees. And so, you know, another rule is like, do not ask anybody for any help unless you see a name tag. And it's right. like, you know, it just says target employee or whatever employee. And so those structural are, are somewhat level answers because it, it stops that curiosity and that level of entitlement. Right. I, I see we have a question and, and by the way, I'm not seeing hand raising for some reason. So if anybody has a question, feel free to direct message me, but thanks for flagging Kristen. I see we have a question from Mary Lou Watson. You want to turn on your mic? Yes, thank you so much. And Nicole, thank you for, for sharing those stories. I think it's really important for us to, to know our stories. You know, you hit on a point that I think um, we all can certainly take away from this, with, especially with the question of what can we do, right? And I think first and foremost, remember that we are all a part of the human race. And when we hear a story that happens or we, we hear about something like you falling or, you know, people stepping over you or the nanny story, you know, just at first think about it in, from the perspective of, oh my gosh, like what if that was my sister, you know, or what, and I think that if we start to, you know, redirect our thought process as, you know, from, to more of a humanistic perspective, the, the more we'll be able to even develop our own answers because you, you were spot on about, and I've said this many times, is that a lot of times when we don't have someone in our own personal family and personal space that we could say like with women, 
men can say, well, you know, I've got a mother, you know, maybe I have a wife or a significant other, maybe I have a daughter and so on. And you can easily transpose that story onto someone like that in your life, you know, um, and get mad about it. But when you hear about a story about something that impacts someone of color, um, you're, you, you may not be able to kind of relate because right. it's like, well, I kind of don't, don't own that experience, you know? And, and it's so ironic, the stories that you tell, there was, uh, I used to work in near Chinatown and I remember an elderly Chinese woman fell crossing the street mm. and I was approaching that corner and everybody was walking past her. Mm. And, I, and I literally like ran up to her to help her up, but people kept walking, walking past her. And similarly, as an attorney, 21 years ago, I was pregnant with my daughter went into the hospital in labor in a suit like I was about to go to court. My husband was a was a resident. He was in medical school at that hospital, dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, an African-American male, wheeling me in, an African-American female, and wheeled us up to the emergency room check-in. And the first thing that I was asked was not my name or you know how I was feeling. The woman looked at me, saw I was clearly, you know, in labor and looked at my husband and said, are you a clinic patient? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and, and, but I think that it's important for us to share these stories. And I, I really appreciate you being so um, willing and to be, you know, to share these stories because we can learn from that. But I think if we just like look at each other as like, gosh, that could have been my sister or right. my brother and so on. I think it will help us to calibrate ourselves internally as to the right response. So thank you for allowing oh, me to. Oh, you're, you're welcome. And I, and I think you hit on something, you know, I, I wrote um, right after George Floyd uh, happened, um, I wrote an open letter to my, uh, my team in, in a corporate setting. And um, I didn't share the, the details of any of these stories, but I just briefly mentioned that uh, stuff like this happens uh, in everyday lives of black people. And, uh, you know, I was in a very powerful position. Uh, and I was really stunned and overwhelmed by the responses that I received, not only just, you know, the compassionate and empathetic ones, but so many folks said to me, wow, I just, I don't know why, but I just assumed that you wouldn't have experienced this kind of racism. And I think it's exactly what you're speaking to, uh, Mary Lou, that people don't hear these stories enough. They hear those really violent, deadly, horrific stories of racism. But not only do they not hear these, but I'm not even sure if it registers as racist. And so it's so important to have these stories told because I could not believe that there was a disconnect. It was like, okay, I may be head of the business here or your boss or this or whatever, but when I leave the building, th there isn't a sign like that on my forehead. I am just a black woman going about my business and everybody else sees me as that. And so I am just as susceptible to the everyday racism as anyone else. You know, Nicole, something that I think is sort of surrounding the question of Marilou and, and your response to that I think is tricky here is that some people, as we know, are more reachable than others. You know, so for example, when you've had stories before that you've shared with me and said, like, you know, this was racist, I, I, I agree with you. And I think, and I, I've joked with you, I'm like, yeah, because anytime somebody's not nice to me, I'll say to my husband, like, they're anti-Semitic. And my husband's like, maybe they just don't like you. And I'm like, that must be anti-Semitism. So, I mean, we joke about that, but the idea is that we, you know, we're, it, you, you, we have a close relationship or we, there's a relatedness here. So it's, you know, it's the dad with three daughters who suddenly becomes the ardent fem feminist. But the question is when it's not personal for people, those right. harder people to reach at your workplaces or otherwise, how do you access them? Is it the same storytelling? Is it getting them to, to hear the kinds of stories that you're sharing? What, what are your thoughts on that? And I'm gonna turn, by the way, to Jean next, she's got a great question. So just, you're on deck. So just sure, an sure, and, and I'll be brief. You know, look, I think it has, again, it has to be authentic and genuine. People who really do want to figure this out and make 
our world, our country, our workplaces, our personal lives a better place. Um, if they really approach this in a genuine, transparent, and authentic way, I think that's the only way it can start. Um, yeah, I do tell stories. You know, I, I actually really don't speak about race that much in the workplace, um, but I also don't hide it. Um, and so, you know, I share a lot of my of myself. I, br I bring a lot of myself to work. I'm a very transparent leader and person. And so if and when I do speak about a personal experience or about race or even just the topic of diversity and inclusion in the corporate setting, um, I come with a degree of credibility that I had to work for. You know, and so I think if, if uh, you know, th this is, I, you know, this I will speak to for my fellow um, Black sisters and brothers. Uh, I think if we want to be heard, and, it, and this is risky, and I understand it because of, you know, what can come back at us. But, you know, if we, we run the risk of not being believed, of not being seen, of not being heard, and continued injury if we don't speak about this. If we speak about it and also bring to the table other parts of ourself and are transparent and vulnerable about other aspects of our lives, including race, then I think you build the foundation for trust and credibility so that when you talk about these things, and at least now in this environment, I'm not so sure this would have been the case you know, 20 years ago, but at least now, I think there is a willingness to be believed and to understand that this is going on and a desire to hear it to, and to be able to recognize it. And so it really starts with opening up of yourself. And look, that carries a great degree of risk for Black people. And so it's not for the lighthearted. And I give everyone and anyone a pass who can't do it, doesn't feel like doing it, um, isn't ready to do it. But if you are, and if you can, uh, I think it's really, really important towards this, uh, towards this fight. I, I think you're absolutely right, Nicole. And one thing I would add um, is that I think when you do have real allies in your workplace, you know, when, you know, when you were at Hawthorne, if you had, let's say a white ally who really was somebody who is strong and, and, and supportive of you, when you are anticipating an issue, sometimes enlist them if you are comfortable to get on board. You told me the story of being in a meeting once in a, one of your former workplaces where, you know, there was basically an angry black man type of criticism going on. And one of your white colleagues said, you know, called it out before you had to. And what, like, what a relief for you that you didn't have to be the one to say, like, this is not acceptable here. So I'm just wondering if you can add or comment on that. And then I want to, I'm mindful of time, I want to give Jean a chance to ask her question and Roberta, and then we're going to have to wrap up. So I just, we're tight yeah. on time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's a simple thing that um, colleagues and, and allies can do. Um, you, you're right, Debbie, it was, a, it was a, a talent meeting. And so the senior leaders, we were all together, um, basically going through the roster of the entire staff um, and doing a talent review. Uh, and this was a manager that we were reviewing. And um, a, a white colleague of mine had a criticism about him that you know, he was just, he's just so angry and he's just so hostile. I just, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I can't remember what we were, you know, deciding about him, but you know, that that was the comment. And of course, it, I knew, I knew this manager very well and he's not angry and he's not hostile. He's very direct. In fact, as direct as this white colleague was. Um, and because I was, this was one of the first talent review meetings that I was doing in my position there was risk for me to raise something about that, but it was really bothering me, not only because it's just, you know, it's, it's ignorant, um, but it was gonna affect this person's reputation and perha perhaps their uh, career track. When lo and behold, and much to my, you know, pleasant surprise, another white male colleague just said, you know, 
I just got to stop the conversation for a second. We've got to really, really be careful when we are throwing around terms like angry and hostile in a talent review about a black man. Um, I have not, you know, unless you have examples of that, I really think we ought to be careful of this because I, I just, it just sets a tone that it's not appropriate. I was so relieved that I didn't have to be the one to risk that, that I didn't have to be the one to raise it. Um, and it really was a game changer for me. And in fact, going forward, I felt more comfortable to take that risk because I at least knew that there were some allies in the room that would get it, that I wasn't raising it, taking the risk, educating, you know, having to bear all of that. Burden. All that burden, yes. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Jean, and let's leave time for Roberta. Sure. So first, thank you for sharing your stories. Um, and obviously, understanding comes from the sharing of these stories. And I've had conversations like this with my friends of color, and they've we've said, you know, what can we do as allies? And they said, start off by just believing us. And I understand the importance of believing um, their stories and their perspectives. But also, as a, as a lawyer by training, I'm somewhat trained to ask questions to be able to understand context. And I want to be able to convey that I believe them, I believe their perspectives while still sort of keeping an open mind to trying to have a better understanding of the context and the circumstances. So how do you, with your legal background, sort of handle that tension? That's in, and, and I'm sure all the lawyers in the in the room, you know, nodding their head. It's like you know, it's the curse and the blessing, right? Of you know, devil's advocate, seeing both sides, and you know, trying to get all the information. Um, look, you know, I think it's important to know that even for for us, or I'll just speak for myself. You know, there, as I said, I have many stories like these, and in the moment, I'm not even a hundred percent sure that it was racist, and that's part of. The damage, right? You know, it's it, you may have heard other Black people say, "I would much rather see, you know, kind of the hillbilly racist coming at me and know, you know, that this is what know I'm what they for. call me, know how they think about me, you know." And as scary and horrible as that is, I know what I'm dealing with. It's so much harder when you have, you know, systemic racism, insidious racism, um, you know, people who are hiding it. Um, so it is complex and there are nuances and there are, I'm sure, are even incidences that I have come to the conclusion as being racist that maybe weren't. But the totality, I think, of what happens in uh, the everyday lives of Black people is surely leaning towards a side that more often than not, if there is a incident or happening that appears or feels to be racist, that it is. And I think, you know, as a lawyer, maybe that's just kind of the basis that you have to go into. It's like, you know, you, you're you presumed innocent um, until proven guilty. Well, I think that that is applied though to the victim. You're presumed believable until proven of, you know, otherwise. I think you just have to come with that premise because it's so hard. It, it, racism is so well conceived uh, and, and hidden in this country that it's a lot easier to not see it than it is to see it. And so we have to come with the premise of chances are it's there. And unless, you know, there's something that really explains it away, um, that it that doesn't just make us feel good, it truly explains it away, um, then I think we have to start with that premise. Thank you, Nicole. And I just, I want to give Roberta the last question and, and apologies in advance for just asking to keep it brief, as well as your response, Nicole. I just want to be mindful of time. So, Nicole, I'm, I'm happy to meet you. Um, we have a lot in common, as I was at PNC as an in-house lawyer for 14 years. So I know we know a lot of the same people. Um, you mentioned earlier about people having um, skin in the game and that making a difference in how they see issues. Uh, a friend of mine uh, out here where we, where we are has a, an anti-racism training practice that grew out of her son being subjected to a horrendously racist incident in their community when he was riding his bicycle. A neighbor called the police because she didn't recognize him. 
His mom's a stay-at-home mom, a lawyer, but her husband's head of geriatrics for Mainline Health. And when that happened and he was arrested at 14, she said, I've got to do something. What she told me recently, and this is your skin in the game concept, is that the people that she's training, who seem to be the most trainable, are the ones who have biracial children in their families. So she said she's getting a lot of older people whose grandchildren mm -hmm. have a, a, a lot of older white people, men and women, whose grandchildren have a black parent. And she said those are the ones that are all of a sudden they can see the blind has come off and now they know what's sort of going on. So in your concept about skin in the game, could you comment on that, please? Yeah, I think I, I think you actually said it beautifully, Roberta. You know, it's like anything else. I, um, in my family, uh, we have uh, some mental illness. We have um, LGBTQ. Um, you know, we have um, some disability. When you have that experience on a personal level and that, that skin in the game, even though you're not necessarily affected um, outwardly by those things, you just come to every situation so differently. Um, you know, I, I don't want to out any of my family members, but you know, a very close family member of mine um, was diagnosed with a, a, a disability disorder uh, years ago. And ever since then, um, it's something that's commonly joked about in circles. And um, it, it's Tourette's syndrome, actually. And I can't tell you how many times somebody says, oh, sorry, I've got Tourette's or, you know, this and that. I'd heard that a million times. In fact, I probably had said that at some point in my life. And you just hear and see and feel the world differently when you have that connection and that skin in the game. You protect it. I say something about it now. I don't necessarily call people out. I might privately say, hey, by the way, um, it, it's a game changer. And that's why I just implore folks, especially the ones who I know are working as hard as they can at this, that unless and until you have diversity in your personal life, you're never gonna be able to make the progress that you seek. Nicole, I want to follow up on that. I think it's a beautiful way to end, but I want to see if there's anything else that you want to conclude with a parting message, either if I've gotten something wrong or misspoke, or we, you want to insert something in the conversation that we didn't have the time to touch on. The floor is yours. Sure. I mean, I would just leave it with, um, th this was a, another really difficult weekend, right? There was a lot of more stories in the news of, uh, you know, horrible brutality against Black people. And I would just say, engage, you know, um, if you see and hear things that are going on, chances are that the Black people in your world are feeling it intensely. And as a person you know, who, who works in a corporate setting, one of the most hurtful things as a black person is to come to work after an event like the ones that happened this weekend and for none of your white colleagues to say anything about it. And yet knowing that when there's a terrorist act or something else that you know, it's spoken about all the time with deep concern and sadness. Um, just like Debbie said, when she reached out to me around George Floyd, you might not get back what you want or anticipate, but believe me, that engagement at every level and not putting things under the rug, listening, engaging, being transparent, and trying to build that trust to get to that next level of a relationship where we really can bring the light and the heat to these conversations is what's so sorely needed. And uh, I just thank you, Debbie, for the friendship uh, over these, you said 20 plus years. I'm glad you said that because I think it's longer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm just so grateful to be able to have conversations like this with you. And, uh, you know, hopefully this was uh, enlightening uh, to folks to be able to start these conversations in their own world. You are indeed incredibly generous and courageous and inspirational. I love you. And 
Um, I'm really grateful for this conversation. I'm grateful for the forum. Thanks to Kelly Hodge for enthusiastically saying yes to this program. Hi, Kelly. And here's to a lot more conversations like this. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.